in the 1930s, the late 1930s, uh, some economists became particularly concerned about uh, two issues of a kind of methodological nature. One was that the existing models uh, that were available, which attempted to account for market behaviour, in particular looking at, at certain industries, didn't seem to um, contain realistic assumptions. And that's because there were certain industries which had emerged, in particular in manufacturing, such as the car industry, which were dominated by just a few large corporations. The models that existed didn't really uh, assume that this was the case. You either had very many firms in the market competing with each other, or you had monopoly where there was only one firm. So there was a concern to create models that sought to assume that there were only a few dominant firms in the marketplace. Another concern was a particular phenomenon that was occurring in these kinds of markets, these manufacturing industries. And that was that despite the fact that the firms seemed to be competing with each other in some sense, or at least they weren't cooperating with each other. Um, and despite the fact that costs changed, in particular costs were rising, prices of the products being sold was not rising. That is, the prices seemed to be uh, rigid and very stable, if you like. So there was this empirical anomaly which the existing models couldn't really explain very well. As a result of that, you had a lot of creative activity occurring in the late 1930s, theoretical activity, um, attempting to crack this nut. So one of those attempts was what we call the kinked demand curve. And in one of the great coincidences in the history of economic thought, um, the same curve, the same kinked demand curve, was developed by uh, Hall and Hitch in Oxford University and Paul Sweezy at Harvard University at exactly the same time. So let's look at this model and see how it accounts for price rigidity despite the fact that there's no collusion between the firms and despite the fact that you could have increasing costs. So what we're going to assume is that we're dealing with an oligopoly. There's a few dominant firms in the markets, in the market, and the firms possess perfect knowledge and are producing the same product. Now, what we're going to see is that a firm's demand curve, or as we now know, it's also an average revenue curve, will have a kink in it due to the interdependent price behavior of the different firms in the marketplace. That is, rivals will react quickly to any given firm changing the price of its product. So, if, on the one hand, a firm raises its price in the hope of increasing its total revenue, its rivals will respond to that by not following suit. That is, the rivals will keep their prices as they were before. Now, as a result of that, because all of the firms are producing the same product, the firm which charges that higher price will lose many customers to its rivals who are producing the same product but at lower prices. For this reason, the firm that raises its price will face a demand curve which is price elastic. On the other hand, if our firm cuts its price, its rivals will respond by following suit, by matching. 
that price cut. As a result of that, this firm, which cut its price, will gain very few extra customers. It won't steal um, any customers from its rivals because its rivals will simply match their price. There might be a slight increase in the quantity demanded, but that's simply because at lower prices, consumers, and if everyone's lowering their price, we know by the law of demand, when the price of the product falls, the quantity demanded increases. So there will be a slight increase in demand, but not by stealing customers from rivals. Thus, in this case, the demand curve would be price inelastic. Now, it's possible in this case, when firms are behaving in this strategic fashion, that even if the marginal costs of our firm rise or fall, the rational firm will have no incentive to change their prices. And thus, we get an explanation of price rigidity. So let's see how that works graphically. By the way, when we say the rational firm, by rational we mean that the firm is applying the equimarginal principle. That is, it's choosing a level of output where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost for that last unit produced. Okay. And by the way, this is the model that was uh, developed by um, Paul Squeezy. That's the model we're looking at. The model by Paul and Hitch that was developed is slightly different and a bit more complex and messy, so we're going to leave that one aside. And also, it doesn't appear in textbooks anymore. So, here's, our, here's, a, here's one of our firms in the market. And for some reason, it has settled on charging a price of $15, and it sells a quantity of eight. That's eight units of whatever, eight tons of shoes or whatever it is. So, what if this firm increased its price? Well, in that case, the rivals would not follow suit. They would maintain prices where they were. So this firm increasing its price will suffer a large fall in the quantity demanded. So if we draw in the demand curve, which is the average revenue for this firm, the demand curve for this firm's product, we can see it's quite flat, which is you know, roughly indicating that it's a the demand curve is price elastic. But what if, on the other hand, it were to decrease its price? In that case, all of the rivals follow suit, and so there will be only a very small increase in the quantity demanded due to that price cut for this firm. this. So then if we draw the demand curve, the average revenue curve, you can see that it'll be very steep. In fact, the whole curve is price inelastic. Okay, so that's given us our kink. So we've got our kink demand curve. Halfway home. What about the marginal revenue curve? Now remember, for uh, straight line demand curves, the or average revenue curves, the marginal revenue curve will have double the slope. So if we draw in the marginal revenue curve for the blue portion of this kinked demand curve, double the slope is like this. You can see it's downward sloping until it comes to the kink point, the quantity at the kink point. At that particular point, we would say that the marginal revenue curve becomes discontinuous. And for our purposes, we can then say it's vertical. All right. So we get this odd-shaped marginal revenue curve. This is the marginal revenue curve that Paul Sweezy drew in 1939. All right. Now, we want our firm to be rational, so it's going to use the equi-marginal principle to choose how much output it will produce. Let's say 
that the marginal cost curve is here. Where is the optimal output? Where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, where they intersect at this point here, and that is at the output level of eight units. The firm will charge what price? The highest price it can get for its eight units, which is $15. Okay, so now we're ready to explain price rigidity. Because if the marginal costs rise, for example, say there's an increase in the wage rates uh, paid to workers. If marginal costs will rise, were to rise, it's possible that the firm won't change its output or its price. There, marginal costs have risen. Where's the optimal output? where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Again, that's at eight units of output, and they'll charge the highest price that consumers are willing to pay, which is $15. So even though marginal costs have risen, the price and the quantity, price charge and the quantity produced remains the same for this firm. And it's because of that kink in the demand curve that this occurs. And the kink in the demand curve is due to the strategic decisions that the rivals make in or could make in response to this firm either increasing its price or decreasing its price, if it were to do that. Assuming all other things remain equal, that is, assuming the kinked demand curve remains as it is, the only way in which you're going to get a change in price and quantity is if marginal costs rise quite substantially and move beyond the vertical portion of the marginal revenue curve. For example, if marginal costs shifted up even higher, we can see where's the optimal output. Assuming the firm is behaving rationally, it's where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which is at this point here. So we can see now the firm, it's rational for our firm to choose to produce five units of output, given the equi-marginal principle, charge the highest price consumers are willing to pay, which is given by the demand curve here, the blue portion of the demand curve, which is about, what's that? About 16, 16 and a half dollars thereabouts. But that's the only way to to uh, escape that price rigidity without the curves, without the demand curves themselves changing in any way. And that is that.